everybody thinks they're good at Tetris. I mean, who, who's not thought at some point, hey, I'm great at this game? I think everybody goes into a PhD with the perception that they're going to change the world. So, congratulations. We recommend that you award a PhD. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, my family are really pleased because I think that they have been going through this experience with me. I have to say I'm really excited actually because it's been ages since you guys have come and pointed a camera at me and asked me to talk about physics. So yeah, um, I've been in Cornwall working with the University of Exeter and with Hearst Magnetic Instruments, here we are, studying magnets for the last four years. And I've just got so much to tell you, it's really exciting. Hearst do three things. Hearst build Gauss meters. This is a really useful little device. Using a Hall probe on the end of this tip here, this simply records the point magnetic field. The other things that Hearst do, and I'm going to take you on a tour of the factory in a minute and show you around, is build magnetizers and demagnetizers. So if you've got a lump of metal and you want to turn that into a lump of magnet, uh, then you need a machine for doing that, and we build those. But none of that's what I want to talk about. What I really want to talk about is magnetometry. How do you measure a magnet? The very early uh, history of it is is quite ad hoc basically what we have to do is stick the magnet on the end of an iron bar and generate a magnetic field in the iron bar using this coil i suppose what would be useful is if i hold the gauss meter on the end of the bar and i turn up the current and this is quite a big current power supply you can see that there is a magnetic field being generated inside that iron bar so this is lovely because this demonstrates very clearly there is a connection between the electricity in this coil and the magnetization in the in the bar but we can take advantage of that so what i want to do is take my magnet and just stick it on the end and Brace yourself for what is going to be a really underwhelming demonstration here. <laughs> I'm going to ramp up the current in the coil. Oh, there we go. So what we can do, because it's very easy to calculate the magnetic field in the rod uh, as a function of the, of the current that I'm putting into the coil, I can use this now to measure precisely the point at which this magnet is repelled. And so I know now exactly the magnetic field that this magnet is producing. And that's how very early permeameters work. So permeameter is a machine for, for measuring uh, the magnetization of a magnet. And they were that simple. Things have moved on a bit since then. <laughs> so let's go downstairs and I'll show you another piece of kit. This is my new playground. <laughs> in here we've got an old-fashioned permeameter what we've got is some big pieces of solid steel and several thousand turns of copper on each of these so yes you can imagine how much it weighs but what we do with a machine like this is we use the turns just as we did with the little mock-up upstairs to generate a magnetic field across these pole pieces hidden inside and then the magnet sits in between the pole pieces and we drive the magnetic field right across the magnet. Now at the same time it's possible to use a little coil wrapped around the magnet to measure the magnetization of your particular magnet. And it's this magnetization of the magnet as a function of the size of the field that the permeameter puts through it that gives us the, the famous characteristic hysteresis loop of a magnet that's that's what tells you how the magnet responds to an external field and these large lumps of steel inside the permeameter recreate the closed magnetic circuit environment of a, a magnetic machine so this for many years was how you measured a magnet the problem is and this is this is the key thing Back in the 80s, people discovered rare earth magnetic materials, uh, things like neodymium and samarium cobalt, and they are so powerful, they're such strong magnets, that they completely saturate the steel in the permeameter. So we need to get rid of the steel and take a measurement of how the magnet behaves in air. You see, that's what happens. People store magnets like they I'll store that one just there. Well, look, there's one right there. <laughs> <laughs> There's another one. <laughs> They're everywhere. Magnets are everywhere in this place. It doesn't help that all our shelves are built out of metal. This is a modern permeameter, and this is a machine called a pulsed field magnetometer, which is capable of measuring the magnetization and characterizing rare earth magnets. We're changing now from Aunico, which I've stored on the 
side of the cabinet two neodymium magnet samples. So these are really powerful rare earth magnetic materials. I should say this is our test machine. This is the one that we do all of our development work on and you know the box is always open so that we can get into the electronics. This machine essentially consists of a large bank of capacitors which is storing a huge amount of energy. There's, there's nine kilojoules of energy in this machine. So as soon as I press go, all of the energy of the capacitors gets dumped into a big coil, a large elec electric current. We're talking about 10, 20 kiloamps. So it's a really big current. Um, you know, it's like a 10,000 kettles all at once, just for a few milliseconds. And that creates a massive magnetic field, about eight Tesla. So the coil is hidden inside this yellow tube. If you look right through, you can just see the capacitors on the far side, those oh, yeah. gray boxes. They're going to dump all of their energy into this coil and we're going to have a large magnetic field for an instant. And we're going to use that magnetic field to measure the magnet. The sample then is, is in here and I'm going to make sure that it goes into exactly the right point inside this, the coil at the bottom, like so. And then it really is just the simplest pressing start. It's going to magnetize the magnet and then over here we can see the capacitors charging up and discharging as it pulses the magnetic field. Done it. And then the final pulse we do without the sample. And that just allows us to remove any background signal. And there it is. So I know how much you love to include graphs in your videos, but what you're seeing here is the external magnetic field that's being applied and the magnetization of the magnet. So if I come over here, what we're seeing here, uncalibrated raw voltage data. As the pulse, as the magnetic field increases, the magnetization of the magnet shoots up until it saturates at some peak value. And so this is the point at which the magnet's really achieved its, its maximum potential. And then as we reverse the pulse, we begin to demagnetize the magnet magnet. Now for your engineering processes this bit over here is all of the interesting stuff because over here is where the external field is working in opposition to the magnets field. If you're building a machine what you really want is a large external field and a large magnetic field because that gives you lots of force between the two things. So if you want to build a, a really efficient electric motor you want to generate a lot of force between those two uh, components. So that means you're working in this top corner but heaven forbid you should go round the corner because the moment you go round the corner, you're demagnetizing the magnet and you've broken your machine forever. So up here, great. That's where we want to be. That's the machine working extremely efficiently. Over here, you've broken your magnet and your machine is never going to work again. So there's a very fine margin for an electric motor designer to make sure that they're getting their machine in the right place. And that's exactly the information that this machine is, is providing. The thing is, when you take a pulsed measurement in air, it actually gives you a very different result to taking a steady state measurement in the large iron permeameter. And what that does is change the rounding of this corner in the plot. So it changes precisely where your sweet spot for running the magnet is. What we've done um, in conjunction with the University of Exeter's maths department down here in Cornwall is calculate the true mapping. We know how to do it. We know now how to map the air measurement perfectly onto the iron measurement. That's, we're really proud of that, right? But I'm going to frustrate you. <laughs> and the reason I'm going to frustrate you is that's commercially sensitive. I can't tell you how we've done it. I can just tell you that we've done it and we've essentially done it in a way which is completely error-free. Now, since about 1981, that's been done with a really crude approximation called self-demagnetization field correction. But everybody knows it's out. It's out by 10 to 20%. Um, in the important place, it's out right on the corner. It's really important. I mean, if, if we're talking about 10 to 15% error in how we measure the magnet at the working point, then you're talking about motors and generators all being 10 to 15% inefficient. So the real world advantages of having this information is that we give this information to engineers who are designing motors and generators. I sat down, <laughs> just scribbled this out before we made this video, we're looking at a machine like this and the measurements that a machine like this makes being worth about three gigatons of carbon dioxide efficiency every year. And that, I mean, that really motivates me. That gets me out of bed in the morning and says, I've got to come and do this work because you know, it's a hell of a lot better than planting a tree. I mean, obviously do go and plant a tree, um, but three gigatons of carbon dioxide a year just from motor efficiency. It's amazing. But over here, we've got the machine which belongs to the National Physics Laboratory. 
Um, where this is a nine kilowatt machine over here, this is a 90 kilowatt machine. <laughs> the magnets that we can measure on our development machine go up to about 15 millimeters in diameter. This beast can measure a magnet which is up to 68 millimeters in diameter. Here we go, look, we've got one stuck to the cupboard, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> that is a thumping great lump of neodymium, a very, very powerful magnet indeed. So the machine is in a state of reconstruction at the moment. We're making the bore bigger, so this is going to be the new bore size. So the magnet goes down into this hole and then down here, we're making a new magnetizing coil, which is coming in. I've been designing that with a new pickup coil to really improve the sensitivity of the measurement that we've been making. And again, actually what I've done to do that is I've written an AI to do it for me. And we've come out with a really nice result, which is much more sensitive than anything I would have come up with. And what's, what's really fun about that is the AI has come up with a really counterintuitive design, um, which no human being ever would have thought of. But also the result's fantastic. It's a really sensitive coil now. So I'm excited about that. You thought to make it easier, I'll build an AI for it. Like... <laughs> <laughs> it does consume a lot of my time doing all of this. Absolutely. But that's, that's what I enjoy doing. So that's okay. I don't mind. And, and you do a little piece of work like that. It actually took me about two days to put that together. Um, you do a piece of work like that and it's very satisfying because the results are very tangible. You can look at them and say, yeah, I have made that better. Let me show you a couple of other things while you've got the camera down here on the shop floor. Um, over here, for example, we've got some capacitors, 1.4 farads. So this is like a billion times bigger than the capacitor on your circuit board. And it's going to store the energy for a very large magnetizer. And to give you some idea of how much electric current that's producing um, in order to, to run that magnetizer, these are the wires. These large metal strips are the wires that are going to carry the current from these capacitors. So we're producing 10 to 20 kiloamps of current instantaneously to magnetize something. And now I'm going to show you the magnetic circuit that that's going to put that field into, and that's over here. <laughs> and it is an absolute beast. This is the magnetic circuit um, that we're going to dump the current through. Um, so it's going to create a very large magnetic field in there, which is capable of magnetizing, I think it's about one, 1.2 tons worth of metal. Every now and again, somebody rings or knocks on the door and says, we need you to build a magnetizer that will magnetize a ton of metal, please. Uh, it's good fun when it happens, you know, we get to do it. So we've got some more capacitors over here. These are dielectric capacitors. And again, we've got about a farad's worth of dielectric capacitor here. So it's a really major uh, energy storage unit. Actually, I should have checked. I don't know how much energy these particular ones are storing, but it, it'll be in the tens of kilojoules. So I guess I've made all this sound really simple, haven't I? <laughs> oh, if you're an undergraduate physicist and you're thinking about this kind of technology, what we're talking about here is just an LCR circuit, an inductor, a capacitor, and a resistor. But it isn't actually that simple. Because although the ideas are the same, when you're talking about having tens of kiloamps worth of current, it's a lot to control that electronically, the switching and so on. You can't just use a small transistor to put 10 kiloamps into a circuit. You have to have quite a beefy switch. And the other thing that happens, of course, is that once the capacitors, this is like three kilovolts of charge, even once they're discharged, that's an exponential process. It never really reaches zero. So you're left with some stray voltage on the capacitors, maybe 100 volts. And that's a lot, right? I mean, that could really, that could tickle you quite badly. So we also have additional circuitry, which just sucks up that waste charge. And these are just big resistors. So I guess if you've done some electronics, you know what a resistor looks like. It looks like a little cylinder that big, right? Well, these are our resistors. This is where we're dumping the extra charge that the capacitors have, and it just turns it into heat. This is just creating entropy in the universe just to make the machine safe to use. Obviously, that's a big consideration for us when we're talking about 90 kilojoules at 3,000 volts. That's going to leave you smoking in your shoes if you touch the wrong bit. So we have to take very seriously making that safe. I've got into magnets. Um, and I've realized that there is this connection with what I was doing before. Magnets are extremely complex um, physical systems. Um, measuring them and understanding their actual behavior. While I can go to a textbook and just say, oh, this is the idealized behavior of a magnet. Yeah, piece of cake, right? But their actual behavior, their true behavior is always very different to that. What I've realized is that this is really important. As, as we're 
starting to look at developing more electric cars, more wind turbines, generators and so on. Of course, that's all about um, just building more efficient hardware. So the impact that this research has is enormous and that's very exciting. So going to Germany was never a job for life. Um, it was always going to be two years with the possibility of being three. After 18 months, we had a baby. He's gorgeous. We wanted to be closer to family. The place where I was went very quiet and I got a moment of peace and I just sat there and I played my game and it all came together. Everything was just clicking beautifully and by the time people came back, I was only 200,000 points off the world record.